and I guess you can see the screen now. Yes. So just to create more confusion, I changed the title of the presentation. Yeah, it is a review, but uh, I wrote in the title that we are going to talk about near surface statics and the Borromean rings. And it's it's not easy to have a, a general review and try to present a topic so important, so fundamental like statics to a, to a wide uh, audience that might have different interests and different uh, background. So what I've tried to do is to do something which is uh, accessible. It's not too mathematical and it shows uh, some of the uh, important points, some of the basics, but also some of the less known strange relationships that you have between the different uh, components of the challenges of land data. So I, I want to start with a short historical perspective and talk about the technology evolution, how in the past uh, decade or, or 20 years, a lot of things changed, especially onshore in terms of acquisition technologies and geometries and how the data are acquired and processed. And then uh, how this technology evolution changed completely the industry, but didn't really change the challenges of uh, land data, which is, are still the same. Then uh, some uh, definitions on statics, trying to clarify what is the difference between the short wavelength and long wavelength component, why they impact both the focusing and the quality of the image itself and the position of features, trying to explain the link to the velocity. And then uh, why we use this um, metaphorical figure of the Borromean rings to explain the relationship between the different components of this challenge. And then uh, talking about potential solutions, I, I'd like to talk about two aspects. One is uh, what do you do when you already have the data? So the geometry of the acquisition, the parameters, the signal to noise ratio, everything is there and you cannot change it. And what do you do when you design a new server and you have the possibility of influencing the data? How do you try to anticipate how things will be? So if we start with our historical perspective, we can start from the very beginning. So seismic was invented as a tool to detect the enemy artillery. And uh, initially it was the refraction seismic. So people were trying to detect vibrations and understand the, the source of vibrations. And just after the end of the First uh, World War, different uh, scientists and researchers on, in, in Europe and in North America and Canada and the US tried to use the seismic to characterize the medium in which the seismic waves are propagating and not the source itself. And uh, I think this race was actually won by a group of uh, Americans with uh, John Karcher, who about 100 years ago uh, performed and designed an experiment, a reflection seismic experiment. And uh, he drew these uh, sketches where you see sources and receivers and rays and reflections and the equipment that was used. And uh, they actually performed an experiment in Oklahoma, close to the city of Maud. And uh, it's probably the first uh, seismic reflection experiment. We have uh, in the patent the images of the first uh, seismogram that you can see here. Let me just change uh, the pointer. So, so the first seismogram, which is here with different reflections and direct arrivals, etc. The technology, of course, evolved a lot. But the first thing to say is the patent is 1929. So it's a long time between the experiment and the patent itself. And it's because in the meantime, they actually managed to map the Viola limestone and they found a structural high and they drilled it and they, find, they found oil. So it's the first discovery based on reflection seismic, and they probably kept it secret until the patent was published. The technology evolved a lot in 100 years, of course, and today we have uh, uh, incredible technologies that have been developed and pushed into the market. So very light, autonomous, robust, distributed recording systems based on nodes, and we have uh, higher fidelity sources with an incredible performance in terms of ability of repeating a certain signal and shaking for years without stopping in a very start implementation. We have higher productivity strategies and solutions that allow to have 20 fleets shaking at the same time and getting an incredibly high data density. Then we have automation, which is probably the next step in seismic. And we have remote command and control that allows to control remotely a crew and process the data even remotely starting quickly. So the, the changes are not only logistical. The logistics, of course, has been revolutionized because what was a string of geophones with tens of geophones and cables is replaced today by a single node. And we can discuss about the advantage of having multiple sensors, etc. But the logistics and the possibility and the incredible flexibility on the geometry is something that obviously is extremely valuable. And when you talk about automation, there are ways today to have, to have uh, machines that are able to go find a point, pre-plot, spray paint, and we have the possibility potentially 
to have something that is drilling a hole and is putting a node, sticking a node in the ground in a completely autonomous way. It's not something that is still uh, in the industry as a standard commercial process, but it's something that might come. In terms of remote command and control, obviously the satellite connectivity that today allows to have a connection, a data connection to any point in the world, is something that allows to run remotely processes. And we have used it supporting, for example, seismic operations in Yemen a couple of years ago without having people on the ground. So the data were harvested, correlated, analyzed, pre-processed, operating everything remotely by a satellite connection. So there are lots of new things and uh, it's a real revolution in the operations. But the point is, is this solving the problems of land data? So we have today data with, which have no problem at all, in which we don't have any issue with the near surface, with the noise. Obviously not, because these issues come from the very nature of the wave field and the fact that it has to go through very variable properties, through a very variable near surface. And if you look at this gather, so the 1929 published shot gather of John Karcher, you can recognize the direct arrival, the reflection from the Viola limestone and the ground roll. And if you go back to the same site today, you will get the same thing. Of of course, the data will be better. And this is, is not a joke. This is a data acquired at the same position uh, in uh, 2020 during the first uh, COVID lockdown for a small British American operator who is exploring near Maud in Oklahoma. And these data, obviously, they are much better. They are dense nodal data acquired in 2020 with vibro size. But when you look at what you have, you still have the same ground rule. You still have the same arrival times, the same perturbations of the arrival. Obviously, this is the very nature of the data and we cannot just acquire different data and uh, ignore the problem. And uh, where are these challenges coming from? So if I show you this land shot gather, you will tell me, no, 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 this is not a land shot gather. This is obviously a marine shot. And uh, the difference is that in this gather, I would say that every single pixel in this image is signal. And we could argue that, of course, there are multiples and you see a very strong water water multiple there. And this is maybe not signal, but still it depends very often on the reflectivity of something in the subsurface. If you look at a land shot gather, a typical, I would even say a good land shot gather like this one, the situation is obviously different. If you are used to look at land data, you will say, well, it's not bad. You can even see some reflections here. And uh, the signal to noise ratio is very good. Before the first breaks, there's not much. Yeah, there are harmonics here, but the wavelet is nice and sharp. Of course, there is a lot of noise and something that uh, is it really noise? What is exactly is sometimes more difficult to, to define. But obviously, 95, 99% of the energy in this uh, shot gather is not reflection signal that you can use easily. And uh, we have to distinguish two complexities in this, uh, in this data, in this type of sampling of the wave field. The noise, which is something that is on top of the signal, is something extra that we cannot really use because it doesn't depend on the reflectivity of our targets. And then the perturbations of the signal. The signal, yeah, it does depend on the reflectivity of our target. It's something that we can use. But on top of the real effect of the reflectivity of our target, you have all the propagation effects and the near surface effects, which change the character of the signal and apply perturbations. It is still signal, but it's not exactly as it should be. And of course, when you look at land shot gathers, you always see things like this, where you have bands of high amplitude, low amplitude, the amplitude changes locally for no specific geological reason. And then you have these uh, pull ups and push downs. And uh, yeah, maybe it is real. Actually, it is real. We have recorded it. But where is it coming from? Is it possible that the wave field coming from a reflection arrives at the surface and there's a 20 millisecond difference over 10 meters? No, it's not. The curvature, if the reflection has been generated down deep, is simply not compatible with the velocity. So these are phenomena that come from something else, perturbations. So. The challenges of land data come from the very nature of the wave propagation and the seismic experiment in the surface, at, at the surface on, on shore. The source radiation, only a very small portion of the energy goes as P wave, 5%, 7%. The rest of the energy is something else. The source coupling changes dramatically from front to point. There are nonlinear events, very extreme nonlinearities under the base plate of a vibrator or close to a dynamite shot, and then perturbations of the amplitude the phase, so the spectral amplitude, the phase, and the travel time, and then noise. Noise, something more, which is added to the signal, and uh, we don't like to call it random noise because nothing is really random in nature, but the term coherent and incoherent is probably a bit more appropriate. It defines what is uh, deterministically reproducible, 
And incoherent noise is not deterministically reproducible, so it can be randomized in some domains. So it's what we normally call random noise, but we like to call it incoherent. And the coherent noise, we need to distinguish it into direct coherent noise. So the guided waves, the Rayleigh waves, something which is source generated and propagates somehow directly, and the scatter coherent noise, which is more chaotic because it depends on the distribution of the scatterers, which is something complex and therefore a looping chaotic. Out of all this stuff, the statics essentially is just the set of perturbations of the travel time. So it's one of, of the many effects that we have uh, on shore. Why everyone talks about statics? Obviously because it's very important and it's probably the, 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 the single step that can have such a dramatic impact on the data. So the statics is actually, it's not a perturbation. The static is the correction. Statics is uh, the short version of static corrections. The perturbation, the travel time perturbations can be extreme. So look at this uh, section. It, actually, it is actually a very long line, like 80 kilometer line across an area where the geology is rather simple. And when you look at what you get, if you have the statics wrong or if you don't have statics, obviously you would even regret of acquiring this data because there's not much that you can say. If you apply the statics, everything changes and you get something like this. So how can the travel time perturbation destroy completely the coherency of the data? It can because the entire seismic processing imaging relies on the multiplicity, on the redundancy of data, and on the fact that we can stack and sum the data along certain trajectories. And if you perturb these trajectories in a certain way, so let's say these hyperbolas somehow, you can destroy completely the coherency. So let's start from a very simple example. We try to model perturbation to understand what is statics and what is not statics, because we hear a lot people talking about statics when we are not talking about statics, but we are talking about something else. So we have this velocity model, which mimics, for example, a simple geology that we can get in the Middle East with very flat geology and then some low relief structure under, for example, this high velocity layer here, which could be one of those anhydrite layers that we have everywhere in the Arabian Peninsula. What you cannot maybe see easily is that to the right of this image, the velocity are slightly increasing. It depends on how you would see it on your screen, but I I, I, I can tell it, the velocities are increasing gently to the right. If you generate synthetic shots in this model, you even add the coherent noise, the incoherent noise, and I'll show you later what we do, and you process it, and you process in, in depth, you will get something that is a pretty good image of what you have with maybe attributes that are not perfectly reliable, but you have something which is uh, particularly uh, good in terms of structural image. Obviously, this is an easy exercise because it's a synthetic data set. When you process this in time and you look at the PSTM of the same line, this is how it looks. And obviously it, this makes a massive difference because on, on one case, when you have the, the real image in depth, you can see that there is a high here, there is potentially a trap. And when you look at the image in time, there is no closure. This is a monocline structure. So this is a complete distortion of the image from time to depth, but this is not a, an issue of statics. And, uh, it's not just, is it shallow, is it deep, where is it coming from? It's, the difference here is that obviously these perturbations, this difference between the time and the depth comes from the fact that we have higher velocity. But when you look at this section where you have the RMS velocity that was picked here, you see that it was honestly processed and picked and the velocity is not perfect and there are problems, but you can see that the velocity increases to the right. So an interpreter would take this result, would do a time to depth conversion, and would get something that will look very similar to this image, to the one that we were seeing just a second ago, if the time to left conversion is done right. Or you would take this and go to PSDM and you would get this one. So this is not statics because the velocity in the processing can be used to get a real depth image, even if it's a long wavelength distortion of the, of the reality in time. What is, for example, a static issue is the one that you have in a case like this. So the top is just a sketch from the BGS uh, website, a buried valley, so typical case, it can be anywhere in the world, it can be in the Middle East, it can be in Europe. You have a, a former valley which has been filled with sediments. At the surface, you don't really see if the velocity changes a lot laterally. And when you repeat the same exercise that we have done, so you generate shots, you get the data and you process them, you have the section that you get here. So this is obviously a completely different story because uh, you can see a sort of hint, a sort of shadow of the presence of something in the shallow, but overall you can't really say what is creating it. And certainly you cannot measure the velocity in the shallow from the reflection data, because if this is 50 meters deep and you are in 3D, you have, uh, if you're lucky, one trace in the near offset. You won't be able to pick the velocity. This velocity won't be measurable from reflection data. So there is something 
which is very small, it's maybe 50 meters thick. It creates a massive distortion in the entire section from the top to the bottom, and you cannot really see it from the reflection data. So you need to know that there is something there and correct for it. The real original model is the one that you see here. Obviously, it is very different. There is no closure and there is a big push down here. But is this, it's that it, this is the only real issue. So you just need to see that there is a time delay and the problem is fixed. And the story is much more complicated. And this is why you, we start talking about these uh, Borromean rings. So the Borromeo family is a noble family, very powerful since 500 years ago in Northern Italy. This is their coat of arms. When you look on the coat of arms, you see these little rings and these uh, three rings are topological. In a topological space, these are three curves which are linked, interlinked to each other. So they are connected and they cannot be taken apart. And uh, these are like the statics, the velocity, and the noise, the statics in red, the velocity in green, and the noise in blue. The problem is that they are so intimately connected, interlinked, that you cannot solve any of them if you still have the problem, the global problem. So you cannot pick velocity if you don't have a decent static solution because you might lose completely the coherence in your data. And obviously, it's very hard to pick velocity if you have a lot of noise. But you cannot really denoise the data properly if you still have uh, a lot of perturbations and if you don't have the velocity, because despite what we always say in processing, very often you need uh, some noise model to be able to denoise the data and signal model. And you cannot really compute statics. You cannot rely on any statistical process if your data are too noisy and if you don't have the velocity. So the problem is that they are so connected to each other that you don't even know from where to start. So if there is a standard sequential step a series of steps that you want to do and you try to do it in the conventional order, sometimes it simply doesn't work. The interesting part of the Borromean rings is that, yes, they are simple closed curves in this three dimensional space. They are topologically linked and they cannot be separated, but they break apart into unknotted and uh, unlinked loops if one of three is cut or removed. So if you, for example, solve the statics, the other two can be solved become non-linked. It's, it's just a metaphorical image to have something to remember these three elements. But the message is that the velocity, the statics and the noise are very strongly linked, are very strongly linked. And it's not really easy to say what has to be done for the statics if you don't have a strategy for the other two. So let's continue with the modeling and showing how we can reproduce most of the things that we see modeling data. And in front of our office in Brisbane, there's a parking and they have these nice limestone slabs on the wall. And one of these slabs is one of our favorite models that we call the Brisbane model, because it's a very nice, a simple uh, structure with some complexity in the near surface. And this is transformed into, for example, a density model. So this is the mass density and we add some small markers so that we have some clear reflectors that we can see. But we build a full elastic set of parameters with a VP, VS and mass density, and then we simulate data. We simulate data with a finite difference elastic simulation so that we have gathers with different geometries in 2D in this case, but we do it in 3D very often. And we can simulate the data and see what happens if you have a certain approach for the statics, how deep the statics can be. Can you compute statics when you have a velocity inversion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the interesting part of the Brisbane model is that if you get this velocity model that you have here and you process it to PSTM, so you generate the shot gathers with the noise and all the other stuff and you process it in PSTM, you get a very good result. And uh, well, this is also interesting because it helps to explain what are the edge effects. Sometimes people will say, why I need to extend my line by two kilometers? And you say, yeah, because look at this, you don't see anything on the edges. And it's not because uh, there's something strange on the edges because you are not illuminating it. But apart from this, uh, you know, these two triangles on the edges, it's a very good image. And uh, considering that the data that we've created are very noisy, it actually answers most of the questions. What happens if this high velocity layer, that one that here is shaded in yellow, has a different shape? What happens if we put a high velocity layer going closer to the surface? And uh, be careful here. The point is that this is a high velocity zone. It's not a low velocity zone. But uh, very often we forget what are the basic assumptions of the static computation. So we now put a high velocity zone going close to the surface there. And uh, you see the image in PSTM without the high velocity and they imagine a PSTM with that velocity. So we have a high velocity zone here. You expect it's faster, it takes less time to go through this stuff. So less time, it means a pull up. 
we expect to find a pull up below this anomaly. And when you look at what we get, yes, there is a pull up in the shallow 500, 600 milliseconds. But when you go below, obviously there are more complex effects and distortions. So there are layers crisscrossing each other here, and there's even a push down below. The point is that the perturbation that this high velocity close to the surface is inducing simply cannot be fixed with a static correction because it's not static. Static means it doesn't move. It's constant for the different offset. It's surface consistent. And in this case, it's not. So this, it's a near surface perturbation, but simply cannot be fixed easily as a static shift. What we have to do here is characterize the near surface, get a model, and go to depth. And here, what you see is on the left, the PSTM, pre-stack time migration. The difference is not time and depth. Obviously, is that the migration operator allows to take into account the lateral velocity variations. So in time, you will get this massive distortion and the crisscross and the push down and in depth things are OK. So the first thing is, yes, we can and we have to compute statics, but we need to be careful what we try to do because certain things cannot be fixed simply with a time shift. And then let's continue with the models. Let's take our Brisbane model and you see what you have with a simple model without the velocity anomaly in the shallow. The reflectivity goes up, but there are no high velocity there. Then we include the high velocity anomaly, and then we start adding the near surface complexity. You start adding a low velocity zone in the overburden. So now it's a low velocity, which is more plausible from a, let's say, geophysical viewpoint, because often you have low velocities at the top with the unconsolidated sediments. But it's not always the case. There are so many cases where you have a hard near surface, a fast near surface with outcropping carbonates and, and all the different potential combinations that you can find. But we have included here a low velocity zone, which is a velocity which is reasonably slower than what you have below, and it's relatively simple in terms of geometry. And then we add, to contrast it, a near surface which is complex especially, and it's not an extreme complexity. The, the horizontal scale is actually not uh, meters, these are cells, so these are 15 kilometers. So this is a medium range variation. And then we try to look at what happens to the data. Again, we go to the simple model and we try to see what happens. The first will be the PSTM in a very simple case without this high velocity anomaly. Then we add the velocity anomaly and we try to process in PSTM. And, uh, very honestly, we try to pick the velocity, we try to do the best we can to get something that makes sense in PSTM. And this area, when what you see here is the real velocity that was picked by someone processing this line. So the high velocity is in the shallow, but there's no reflectivity, near offset, poor near offset. We don't really see that the velocity is faster and we have not used the refractions here. So the velocity somehow impacts the velocity below. And when you look at the gather, if you are far enough from the anomaly, they look reasonably correct. But as soon as you get close to that anomaly or inside the anomaly, you see the strange type of distortion that you get. And this cannot be fixed with statics. I'll tell it again. The problem is that it's not static and it's too fast to be fixed uh, with a simple static shift because the rays are not refracting, increasing their angle, but they are actually diving down. What you see here is also the origin of the push down that you see below. And it's because of how we pick the velocity. In depth, obviously, the problem is fixed. But now, Let's look at the other complex cases. Let's look at the shots. This is the very shallow on the left side of the model without the near surface. And you can see it's it's a, it's an acoustic shot gather in a simple model, but the complexity of the model makes it a bit more realistic. So you have a scattering everywhere, you have diffractions, and it's not a perfect, extremely clean shot gather. When you add the near surface, you see that there will be a push down an overall push down, an overall delay, you see the refraction coming there and you will see that laterally some of the velocities will change. The velocity here is perfectly linear because of the changes of the thickness of the near surface, it will change. But it's still a, you know, a very well behaved situation in which static solution will solve the problem. And I'll show you in a moment that in this case, a static solution will fix this and show it at the right position. But then let's look at the other case. The case where the near surface is complex and is creating perturbations and diffractions, and it's actually destroying the coherence of the signal. This is something that we see in many environments with basalt, with carbonates, with cars, in many environments where the near surface is complex. You can get this type of dramatic impact on the data. And this is something that is not just a travel time distortion. Look at the results on the sections now. This is a, a PSTM without the statics. This is with the case of the high velocity here and the statics, but the statics will fix everything, will not fix what happens in the middle. 
And now look at what you get when you have uh, the complex near surface. Just as a reminder, there is no incoherent noise on this data. So the fold, you can multiply the fold by 20 and you will probably get the same stuff. It's not a matter of decreasing the level of the incoherent noise. The problem here is that the very signal is distorted to a point where certain things are not really summed to each other. And then we have to imagine that sometimes working with a complex near surface, it's like trying to work in the pre-salt or in the sub-salt without really seeing the top of salt. And the situation, it is very similar because imagine that you have uh, something on your swimming pool and you look at the shadow at the bottom of the pool. The shadow obviously is round, but when you look at the shadow, very often you see something like this. It's very realistic because it's a it's actually a picture. It's an animation. And you see here that the shadow and the, you know, obviously, and I promise the shadow is round because the shape of the object at the surface is not changing. But what we see is very distorted. The reason is that the image of the shadow, which is round, goes to the surface. If the surface is flat, the rays will change their direction in a very coherent way. They will stay parallel. They will change direction because the refractive index of this, you know, in the water and in the air is different. The speed of light is changing, but we will still see a round image. If the surface is irregular, every single ray, every single portion of your deeper image will be sent into a different direction and you will see something which is very distorted. So this is what you see in this image, in this animation, and this is what you see in this gather. In this gather, which is completely distorted because the reflections which are coming down from here, they are just diffracting and, and sent in different directions. It's not only the diffractions, it's really the change of the ray path. So this is not something that you fix easily with statics. So what can you fix with statics? What are these statics? So the statics are corrections, simple time shifts that we apply to the data to compensate for the variation of the ray path length related to surface variations, the topography, the tide when you are offshore, the velocity in the water, all these small features that you can get offshore that can be important in certain environments, but are typically less important than the dramatic effect that you have onshore when you have near surface velocity anomalies. So static corrections, shortened statics are simple time shifts and they are very robust and they are pretty accurate when the near surface is thin and when it's slow. And I think uh, the word that I want to emphasize here is that they are very robust because it's a very crude approximation. But still in 2023, there are lots of cases where it's the best solution to apply onshore. And people will try to say, well, let's get a wonderful velocity model and let's migrate RTM at the topography. And then, yes, we can try, but very often we'll say, well, maybe it's better to apply at least some statics before doing it. So let's look at some very simple examples just to classify the, the, the short wavelength, the long wavelength, etc. So very simple model, Again, very simple geology, the same one that we saw at the beginning, but now we have a variable thickness of the near surface. Uh, we don't even include, introduce here the velocity, bit, but the, the effects are very similar. If you put your shots and receivers below the near surface, you will see in time something which will be very similar to the depth image that you see here, this sketch. If you put your sources and receivers at the surface, you will have a portion where your sources and receivers are further from the reflectors and the portions where they will be closer to the reflection closer in space, so it will take less time, it will be a pull up, it will arrive earlier. So if you put your shots and receivers at the surface, you see a sort of mirror image of the elevation. And then this is the basic, the most basic approach. You just try to guess how much the elevation changes impact the travel time and you apply what were called elevation statics, which is a very simplified and very crude approach, which still I would say is the standard benchmark to compare any static solution because uh, if they do not perform better than the elevation statics, then we have a problem. Because the statics, what the statics will do, will take your shots and receivers at the surface and will compute the traces as they would look if they were below the surface or above, but removing all lateral velocity variations and thickness variations. And you can transform the data back to a time image that will look as close as possible to a real depth image. So it looks wonderful and easy when you look at a section and we are thinking at zero offset, we are doing simple sketches in PowerPoint. We need to look at what happens into a single CMP when you have different offsets. What is the real impact of the statics? 
again, if you have your shots and receivers below the surface, if you think that you are just, let's say, redatuming, even if it's not really the real world, but putting them to a different reference, a different datum below, you could say, yeah, yeah, I have this nice hyperbola, and the hyperbola is a very simple uh, curve, which is asymptotic to a certain line that has to go to zero to be hyperbola, otherwise it's not hyperbola anymore. And here, you say, well, the reality is that our shots and receivers are at the surface, so there is some extra travel time. This extra travel time is the one that the shots sent, sent down to this uh, first contrast. If the velocity contrast is large and positive, if the velocity increases, the rays become more horizontal, and the last or the first part of the path is almost vertical. And this, sometimes we forget, but this is the basic assumption of the statics. This part of the path has to be as vertical as possible to make sure that we can call them statics, that they don't change with the offset. So the velocity has to be small and the contrast of velocity has to be large and the thickness maybe not too large. So, but when you look at what happens in a C and P, you see that you have uh, strange distortions. They don't really mimic the, the elevation anymore because it's positive and negative, etc. But you will see this type of distortion. And uh, you could say that well, yes, I compute now the travel time and apply it, and I get my correction and my hyperbola is reconstructed. The problem, and a lot of problems come from this, is that you cannot shift the seismic data by 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds without consequences. So the point is you cannot apply all the statics at the beginning of the processing because when you shift hyperbola, it's not hyperbola anymore. The hyperbola has to be asymptotic to a velocity. So it's not hyperbola anymore, but maybe in the near offset is not so bad. The point is that you are changing the velocity. If you shift up and down a hyperbola, you change its velocity, at least its apparent velocity. So this is something that implies the need of defining things that are a bit exotic, like the floating datum plane or the CMP datum or the floating datum in depth compared, converted to time. So lots of things that have to be done to compute and apply statics that have a lot of consequences on how the velocities are picked, etc. But there are two types of perturbation that we are looking at. The first one is what happens when you have data and you know that you want to see this geology, but you actually see this. So you change the structures, you change the shape of the stack. And the other is what happens when you try to stack a CMP that has these perturbations and you will lose all the stack power, all the advantages of the redundancy of the seismic data. So another simple scheme here, and you have a certain image point and imagine that everything is flat and nice and easy and you can draw the rays like this and you have your hyperbola but the reality is that you are going through a variable near surface where the velocity changes and the elevation changes as well and we need to categorize the statics because this has a big impact on how we deal with them so what we call the long wavelength statics are the component of the perturbations that are corrected with the long wavelength statics. Very often we say, ah, these are long wavelength statics. We mean actually, these are the long wavelength perturbation that we will fix with long wavelength statics. So imagine that uh, bright means slow and dark means fast. Where it's fast, you have a pull up. The image, as you can see, it's a very simple anticline. And when you look at the results of applying these perturbations in the near surfaces, you actually see two anticlines because you have uh, two pull ups and one push down. And this, on a scheme like this, maybe it looks a little bit extreme, but if you have seen data in certain uh, very low relief structures, including the Paris Basin, with a complex near surface like chalk, which is dolomitized, it's fast and slow, sometimes there are structures that are wonderful, they look realistic and they're completely wrong. So these structures are extremely dangerous from an exploration viewpoint because they look real. And that even if sometimes we have ways of understanding if it's real or not, they are very plausible and they come from something sometimes in the very shallow where you can't really see what's going on. Then on the opposite, we have the short wavelength statics. The short wavelength statics are the perturbations that happens within your spread in a sense that will make, for example, in this uh, scheme, very nice and high frequency and sharp and full of detail, the image on the left, and blurry, lower frequency with a lower resolution, the image on the right. Because, I mean, this, this looks like a, PowerPoint, but we have simulated the data and we process the data on the left, even if the velocity is very simple, you can see small features that are very likely channels and on the right you cannot see them because your gathers, if you do not apply the statics, will look like the one that you see on the right. So the traces will be jittering up and down. This loss of high frequency is something that happens all the time, inevitably, but 
As more, um, the more you recover, the better the quality of the image is, the sharper the image, the better the resolution. So if you see an image like this, you would probably be happy. But if you know that this, again, is reconstructing the image, applying the time shift locally and summing it together in the real images like this, you can see how much detail you can lose and the distortion that you can get with statics. So the short period statics are typically the component that can be corrected statistically. And the statistics, again, there are lots of different approaches, but if you go back to the basics, the statistics is within a single CMP, it can be a super CMP, you can do all the tricks that you want, you can try to align the first break sometimes, but you need to see that within a certain range of offsets, the traits that should be identical are actually different, and you need to find what is uh, surface consistent, what shift up and down, and apply it and correct for it. This is something that can have a tremendous impact, because if the data are very noisy, this won't really work. And I have an example here of a, a very long line, another long line. This is more than 100 kilometers in northern Australia in an area which is complex because you have shallow basalt. So the data are very noisy. Everyone is saying the data are very noisy. But is it what noise are we talking about? When you look at the noise, it's not really noise. It's all the source generated perturbations that you have. It's not the external noise. The problem is still that since it's very difficult to see clearly the coherent signal in the data and there are perturbations, if you don't fix the problem and you just try with a conventional approach one step after the other, you get this result. If you are able to decouple the different steps and fix the statics independently of everything else, you will get this result. So the statics, even if they are not really extreme, they are able to destroy basically completely the coherency of this section. So this is a more than 100 kilometer and you basically cannot follow layers, you cannot track them. And this is what you can get with the proper statics. So again, it looks like OK, fine, so we need to compute the long wavelength statics. Typically, we will need a model. Statistics for the short period statics, so different technologies and techniques that are able to compute this jitter and compensate for it. It's easy, but actually there are some subtle things that very often we forget. And is, for example, what about the replacement velocity? What is the replacement velocity that we need to choose? Does it impact at all, for example, the dips and the structures? And look at this example. So this is the section I was showing earlier. I was showing only the right hand side. There is a valley somewhere in between. There are hard outcropping layers on the left and the sand dunes on the right. And when you apply the statics, you get something that is much better. But now the question I have is why there is a change exactly at the position of the valley? And it could be geological. It's always possible that geology is impacting everything up to the surface and the valley is there because there is a fault or something else. But it's always a bit, uh, you know, suspicious. And uh, is the dip really changing there or is there something else? And look at a very simple example, very, very mild complexity in the near surface. So you have outcropping carbon, it's a fast uh, hard layer, then you have a cliff and then you go to something slower. And on the left of the cliff where this, let's say, sandstone layer is not covered or protected, it changes its properties laterally. The dip is regular, it's always the same, everything is parallel from the top to the bottom. If you look at the section without the statics, this is what you get. Obviously, these undulations, uh, we've created sinusoidal undulations just to make them more visible. Here, they go up and down, and then the layers there looks completely flat and horizontal because they are parallel to the surface. So we are still at the surface or let's say at the floating data. When you correct for these statics, it looks uh, okay. What is above your intermediate datum will have the opposite of the statics. So here you will get something that will be wrong because we had to compute statics down to a deep layer and therefore what is above it, even if it was flat and simple, it's now distorted with a mirror of the statics. But then maybe it's not really visible here because we're looking at three, sorry, four seconds. But when you zoom in and you look at what happens here, there is a subtle change of dip. And where is this change of dip is coming from? Is it is it real? No, it's not real because we have the model. But why we have it? Where is it coming from? The replacement velocity that we are applying essentially describes the position of the elevation in time. And in this case, it is related. It has to be related to the velocities in the shallow. In this case, we use one single replacement velocity, as we always do, and there is an apparent change of dip. So this is something that, again, has to be taken into account. In this case, if you do a time to depth conversion and you know it has been done, you'll fix the problem. You will not have a change of dip. 
But I bet everyone has seen cases where there are changes of deep that correlate with the topography and we still ask ourselves what's going on. So the key of the statics, the key, let's say, sometimes unknown or less known element of the statics that you cannot shift the data. So unfortunately, even if, of course, it's better to migrate to the topography and all this stuff, the fact that you cannot shift the data because when you shift the data, you're changing the velocity forces you to use a CMP datum, a floating datum plane, or call it as, one, as you want to call it, but something that is a temporary reference during the time processing that is able to stay close to where the data were recorded. And then you have a final datum. One of the things that we always struggle with is the intermediate datum because it's, a, it's not intermediate in the sense that it's something applied during the processing and then it's lost. It's something that uh, defines the assumed base of the near surface, because the, if the data processing doesn't really tell exactly what was done in terms of statics, down to which depth you have replaced the velocity, then the time to depth conversion will struggle because you will not know what has already been replaced and which velocity you have to use in your time to depth conversion. So the statics are a complex component of the workflow, but it's very linked to, to the other, to Borromean rings, so the noise and the velocity. So what to do in practice? I think we, we need to distinguish in two cases, when you already have the data and when you plan a new acquisition. When you already have the data, well, you know that you will have uh, perturbations and you will need to do perturbation corrections and you will have noise and you will have to do noise attenuation. And uh, one of the common elements, the common ground of these two aspects is the near surface because the perturbations, Yes, they come also from the overburden. You might have a gas pocket creating absorption and other things below the near surface. But typically the variability that you have in the shallow is an order of magnitude larger than the one that you have below because the velocity can be 300 meters per second and 3000 meters per second at a very short distance. And the other thing is that most of the noise, the coherent salt generated noise, it's actually propagating in the near surface. So the near surface is the common denominator of these two. And if we understand how the near surface is, if we can see it, then we can, on one hand, do model-based perturbation corrections. So we try to compute the statics based on a model and we can do a model-based noise attenuation. The near surface characterization means we don't just want the statics, we want a model, we want to be able to see the model. There are techniques and I'm going to insist on the surface waves because I, I love it. I've done a lot of work in, when I was young on this stuff. And I think it's one of the still overlooked components of the workflow. There are today very accurate, very robust, efficient diving weight tomography approaches and full waveform inversion approaches. But when the data are very difficult, both will struggle. And onshore, to be honest, in many cases, the full waveform inversion is adding a little bit on a very good diving weight tomography, but it's still using only that component of the wave field just after the first blocks. The advantage of the surface waves is that they are the strongest component that we have in the data. When you have a source at the surface, you generate body waves going down into the earth on spherical wave fronts, but you generate essentially surface waves. Two thirds of the radiation are surface waves. They have a much lower geometrical spreading. They have a very short wavelength. And the short wavelength is an advantage because they are extremely sensitive even to small features. They are able to detect small features in the near surface. The drawback, the limitation is that they are essentially sensitive to the shear wave velocities. The key property that we have to understand and use is the fact that the wavelength affects the propagation depth. If you have a 10 meter wavelength, it will stay in the first 10 meters. A 100 meter wavelength will stay in the first 100 meters. So if you have a homogeneous medium, nothing interesting happens. The different wavelengths will see the same material. But if you have a vertically heterogeneous medium, layer medium, then the short wavelengths will stay in the shallow. They will tell us what is the velocity of the shallow and the long wavelengths will go from the surface down to a larger depth. They will tell us the average velocity down to a larger depth, which can be hundreds of meters. So the, the, the consequence of this different penetration is that the velocity changes and we have uh, long wavelengths, typically low frequencies, being typically faster, you see in this animation that this red triangle is faster because they will affect a deeper portion of the near surface, they will see faster layers. So there is an extra property of the wave field that we can use. The velocity is a function of the frequency, so the different frequencies disperse. They start together and they disperse. Some are faster and they will arrive earlier, some are slower, they will arrive later. So the dispersion is the physical property of a wave phenomenon that is a, as a velocity function of the frequency, but it's also a physical property that we can use exactly as the refraction and the reflection. 
So the waves interact with the media with the heterogeneity, showing reflection, refraction, diffractions, and dispersion. So we have something in the data that has the advantage of being the nastiest event because it's the strongest, but it's also extremely variable because it will be very it will be very sensitive to small velocity variations. It will be able to detect velocity inversions. If you have limestone over a slower sandstone, you will be able to see the fact that the velocity decreases with depth. We extract the dispersion curve, so the relationship between the frequency and the phase velocity, and we use it as a measurement, as data that go together with the diving wave, for example, the travel time, and potentially with the full wave form for the acoustic component into giving a, a near surface model. The advantage is that when you combine these different measurements, you have sometimes a stunning detail. And these are depth slices in a 3D survey, very irregular 3D survey in a very complex environment in the middle of a city. And these are very shallow slices from 20 meters down to 200, 300 meters below the surface. So I think, well, we, we like to plot them in grayscale because they look uh, radiography. And the interesting thing is that you see on the shallowest slice that we have a, a buried valley, a sort of canyon that goes down here, and there is nothing at the surface. The current path of the river goes to the north, and then you see a fault cutting the area in two. So not only this is something that reveals a lot of very useful uh, shallow structural geology, but it's also something that can be computed, okay, sorry, can be used to compute a static solution, but also can be used to drive the modeling of the coherent noise to attenuate the noise in certain environments when it's aliased on where it requires um, uh, to model the noise in a very irregular geometry. So this makes a big difference when you are when you have very complex near surface, getting models combining different tools gives model that can be looked at, can be understood, can be geologically proved and can be used for the corrections of the near surface perturbation. In low relief structure, this obviously can be something with a dramatic exploration uncertainty impact because you see a bump, you see a structural high and in many environments, it's really hard to make sure that you are not looking at the effect of near surface anomaly. And then people would drill hundreds of apples and would try to calibrate, but there's always the doubt on what is the reality of the structures at depth when you have this type of environment. The other thing is, once you have a very accurate model of the near surface and of the surface wave propagation, you are able to model the surface waves. And even when they are badly aliased, you are able to model them beyond aliasing and subtract them. So it's a it's a double advantage because you can also use model based noise attenuation. And then the other scenario is uh, what do you do when you have uh, to design and acquire the data? So how do you get better data today? How do you take into account this type of complexity and try to manage it? Obviously, we all know that you know, to get better data, you need higher density, higher signal to noise ratio and broader data, so more receivers on a denser microgeometry, microgeometry, higher fold, higher signal to noise ratio because you have a stronger source power and broader data. But the point is how dense is dense enough? Because uh, of course, in certain examples and certain papers that were published a few years back, we could see that actually it never stops improving when you look at certain attributes. But obviously there are all the operational constraints and the cost and the budgetary limitations of uh, new acquisitions. So how dense is dense enough? The problem is that Answering this question means taking certain responsibilities from uh, the design geophysicist of telling to a client, yeah, obviously, if you double the fold, it will be better. But in this case, you don't need it. You can be happy with, you know, 40 meter spacing, for example. It is very difficult, but it's not impossible. And again, we need to look and understand the land data, their complexities to be able to reproduce it and use a better proxy for the quality than the signal, sorry, than the fold which is the typically used uh, proxy, higher fold, higher quality, and the square root of n. But uh, their land data are actually very complex beasts with noise, perturbations, and all this sort of uh, complexity we were just discussing. So uh, these are real data, and you can see here that uh, there are coherent events, so the fundamental mode of the Rayleigh waves, higher modes going down, and then you have a source of noise by the side of the line, which is creating these hyperbolic events, which are especially correlated, they are coherent, but this is incoherent noise because if you repeat the shot, it won't be there. So you need to understand what is actually the type and the regime of the different noise types that you have in the area, what are the properties of the surface waves, you look at the data in common shots, in common receiver, and then we will be able to model most of this. And again, 
at the beginning you say, no, that's impossible, you cannot do it. But actually it is possible and it is even affordable if you decouple the different components. So what we are trying to do is on one hand, you generate acoustic signal and the signal is something that you want to generate uh, testing different scenarios for your real targets, testing a uh, change in a certain attribute uh, in AVO properties. So you want to use accurate petrophysics model for the acoustic or, or the elastic simulation of the signal. And then you add on top of the signal the coherent noise. You add here, you can see the distortions of the vibrators. They can be modeled very easily. You can add the laterally varying aliased multimodal dispersive surface waves. But you don't need a very fine elastic grid for a 3D simulation to do it. You can use a different propagation model. And this makes it much faster and much more affordable. And then you can add the incoherent noise, the let's say random noise or ambient noise, which is not random. And what you see here is, is not real, it's synthetic. But it's not a white random noise because that goes away very, very easily and too easily. It's not really representative of the reality. So this noise is created, and I tell you in a moment how, how it's created, but it's created assuming that you know more or less where the sources are and it's simulating scenarios. The lateral variability of the surface waves, if you already have data in the area, you can, you can use the existing data. If you don't, you can try to guess at least a reasonable special variability looking at satellite images and saying, well, I don't know if it's fast or slow, but I guess what is fast or slow. What is more important is I know how rapidly it changes from fast to slow. And this is something that even satellite imagery can tell you. And also you can say, well, the places where I have large changes of properties are very likely sources of scattering. So you can add the scattering sources. And then the incoherent noise, so the random noise. If you add white random noise, it's better not to add anything because it just goes away as soon as you stack. This is surface consistent, incoherent noise, which is actually a set of sources going around your survey with different power, different strength, and adding propagating waves to your data. And they can be completely decoupled. They are generated separately with a shallow propagation model because most of the noise is actually propagating again in the same usual and nasty near surface. The advantage that this noise is very realistic and you can generate it changing how much noise you expect to have. You can add the wind noise, you can add the flare, the pumps, the pipes, the infrastructure, the trucks, the trains and everything you want. So an example here. The acoustic signal on the left, we add the elastic near surface noise, so direct and scattered surface waves. And as you can see, the near offset are completely wiped out by the scattering because we say, ah, this is an area with a lot of scattering. Let's see what happens. Still, the acoustic signal is very easy. And then you add the incoherent noise. The one on the right, you might say, well, maybe you went a little bit too far. It's a bit too noisy, but this is pretty realistic for acquisition in urban areas, which is becoming more and more common with geothermal exploration. And this is the data that were acquired at the site for which the simulation was generated initially. So it, of course, it's not exactly the same. It's cleaner in the near. Here, for some reasons, there was a very strong source with very low frequency component that it was not in this specific simulation of the noise on the right, but the overall behavior is similar. The far offset are really hard to pick. You can't really pick the first breaks. How do you compute the statics if you cannot pick the first breaks? Here you get, for example, surface waves. The advantage is that we have a noise model that is physically sound and it's physically meaningful. We are modeling the noise and we know that we'll have 0.01 millimeter per second particle velocity at 10 meters from a driving truck. And we know how much uh, vibrations a flare, a pipe are producing, etc., etc. And then you can say, OK, what is the source that I need? And you can tune your parameters, for example, on the left, 120,000 pound fundamental force so four heavy vibrators in a fleet. On the right, it's one single mini vib, 12,000 pound vibrator. And then, of course, everyone will say, yeah, the fold will fix it. Just uh, do a very dense survey. Yes, this is what we did, five meter spacing. And uh, even with five meter spacing, the targets at depth are not really visible because the level of the ambient noise that we expect here is such as the signal will not even stack out, even if you have a fold of 1,000 because the signal is too weak compared to the noise. And the other thing that you can do with this is then adding the perturbations and seeing with this level of noise, is there any chance of doing full waveform inversion? Is there any chance of doing surface wave inversion? Is there any chance of picking the first breaks up to the maximum offset? So maybe we went a bit too far and we touched a bit on too many topics, but if we conclude, the challenges of land data come from multiple factors. But 
I think it is very important to say that it's not only the factors themselves, but it's their relation, how they relate to each other, how they are linked, which makes a big part of the difficulty of dealing with them. If we have to conclude with a simple motto, when it's processing and the data are really challenging because of this, for example, perturbation, statics, noise, or whatever the of the three is the most important one, decoupling these Borromean rings is key. So we need to fix some of them. We need to be able to cut one of them somehow and model-based near surface characterization for the statics for the noise is probably one of the options that we try to use a lot when data are really difficult. And when it's about designing service to make them work, simulation has to be used more. We really think that today we can simulate most of the things that we find in data. And uh, yes, yeah, sometimes uh, it's computationally expensive, but it's always cheaper than going in the field and acquiring a server that won't work. And it's even cheaper than saying, I don't really know if it's enough, so let's just double the fold, as we always say. So it's better to design, simulate and study so that we can actually design the optimal survey. Keeping the operations in mind is key because obviously the budget constraint and the operational constraint will always uh, rule. So that was the last uh, slide.